we need a, uh, a better ruling class, so to speak. Uh, that is, we need better ideas in our um, office holders about foreign policy. How do we get that? And in particular, what resources are there in the American political tradition in our history of foreign policy ideas uh, with which, to which we could return um, seeking wisdom? Well, the first answer, of course, is that you can't perform uh, wisdom transplants. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but as every uh, teacher knows, yes. <laughs> but uh, the, the the second question has has a, has a, a rich answer because we do have a rich uh, foreign policy tradition of success. Uh, the, the the founders' foreign policy was a model of realism with a with a um, lowercase r, mm -hmm. i.e., very very well tied to reality. It was based on the seeking of a proper end, namely peace, and on uh, the, uh, the basic distinction between our business and others' business, and the determination to, uh, to guard our business by all possible means, including war. War was taken seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and and that is really that. If you have these fundamentals, then you can go on to other things. But if you begin to 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 um, conflate our business with those of others, there, as John Quincy Adams warned, there is no end. There is no end to the things and to to, to the uh, not simply the foreign operations, but the the, the, the mental deviations into which you will be drawn, <laughs> how, uh, how quickly you will lose sight of what is really important to you. And what is really important to us is to remain Americans, to remain uh, as blessedly distinct from the rest of the world uh, as we always were. And that uh, healthy tradition, which didn't mean we performed magnificently in all of our wars. No, no, not at all. But what about when does that tradition um, end. Uh, end or become compromised? Ah, it begins. It begins uh, to become compromised in, in intellectually in the 1880s by uh, the the growth of um, of an easy hubris. Uh, in the, eight, the the leading books of the 1880s, uh, in, including Woodrow Wilson and certainly uh, Josiah Strong's uh, Our Country. Mm -hmm envisaged a, a very powerful America who could basically do anything at all and do it peacefully, do it without cost. Why? Because we were so obviously great. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, a few years later, there, the uh, part of that tradition, uh, which had seen America as the example of the world, morphed into, a, uh, into the belief that um, the world would would follow us, and that we could actually go out and teach the world, and the world would be our eager pupil, uh, and that we need have no power mm -hmm. backing that up. Theodore Roosevelt, who was a progressive in in many domestic matters, was a staunch uh, Washingtonian as regards foreign policy. He always was for a um, uh, for an excess of power over demands. Mm -hmm. uh, for speaking more softly than the size of the stick would warrant. Right. <laughs> yes, the opposite of some of our current Preci policies. Yes. Precisely, and he chastised the the others as those who who coupled the uh, unbridled tongue with the unready hand. <laughs> <laughs> now, so is uh, which is, he called peace with insult. Is this it doesn't uh, work? Is is our war on terror now essentially a kind of Wilsonian it, enterprise? It, it is in your Wilsonian. View? It is uh, it is peace with insult, because especially after our experiences in, in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, the United States is not going to thankfully try to nation build again. Mm -hmm. I mean the yes, no, the, that's, the, I mean, the, the, that's a good thing, uh, but. Nevertheless, our demands on the rest of the world appear not to have diminished, and uh, Barack Obama's expectations that uh, that uh, that not just uh, peoples but um, 
the very seas would, <laughs> <laughs> would obey his administration's uh, priorities. This, is, uh, this can only get us into trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, orthodoxy in foreign policy says that you ought to be asking for a lot less than you can compel, not the other way around. To do the other way around spells bankruptcy. Excess of, of commitment over capacity is bankruptcy, whether in foreign policy or in, in, in uh, financial affairs. But, but making the world safe for democracy, Wilson's slogan yes, yes. in World War I, is still something different from making the world democratic, isn't it? Which is, seems to be the, or was the making Bush administration's the well, goal. Uh, it's only slightly less crazy. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> And uh, look, well, what's you, wrong with making the world safe for, for the United States? Now, now, wait a minute. You can make the, you can, uh, it is a legitimate objective to make the world safe for American mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. To make the world safe for other democracies is quite something else. Uh, after all, not all democracies are good. There's this notion that democracies are necessarily mm -hmm. good. We're about to find out in Egypt, just as we found out in. Uh, in the Palestinian territories, that democracy simply reflects the demos. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is you know you don't have to you don't have to be terribly learned to figure that one out. Right. But we have forgotten. Uh, uh, we have what Hermann Kahn used to call educated incapacity yes. about such things. The incapacity to see things which are perfectly obvious to people who are not educated. <laughs> <laughs> now, so to put it crudely, what would the Washingtonian policy be for us going forward in the war on terrorism and also for Iran? Well, with regard to Iran, uh, should we conclude that, uh, and it's by no means obvious, but should we conclude that, uh, as everyone seems to say, that an Iranian nuclear weapons is a mortal danger to us, should we conclude that? Then there is one course of action which is open to us it is not an easy course of action, course of action and it does not involve uh, actually bombing Iraq, Iran rather. It, it, it is simply to exploit our overwhelming economic power by declaring a secondary boycott and embargo on everything Iranian. Mm -hmm. That is to say, we would not trade not only with Iran in any way, shape or form, and we would not trade with anyone who, who trades with mm -hmm. Iran in any shape, way, shape, or form, or anyone with anyone who trades with anyone who does. So, you know, look, uh, this would cause enormous heartburn all over the world. We would be denounced everywhere, but no one, not even Russia, could afford to uh, uh, to go against us. Nobody. Yeah. Nobody. So this would sort of economic suffocation. Could, and it would happen quickly. My, I have I have written elsewhere and explained elsewhere in my books that um, economic sanctions truly applied are far more deadly than atom bombs. It, uh, in fact, they have killed more people than... Uh, than uh, it, but than such a boycott would be an act of war, would it of not? Of course it is. Yeah. It would W-A-R, in the dictionary <laughs> meaning of the term. Yes. And that war would be on our... A Washingtonian would make that war on our behalf for redress of certain grievances, number one, the taking of the U.S. Embassy, mm -hmm. and number two, the, the uh, whatever aid and comfort that the Iranians have given to, uh, to those who killed Americans in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I mean, these were acts of war by Iraq, and they should properly be answered by war, serious war, not a strike by here, Iran. a strike right. by us. Right. No, but acts of war by Iran. Acts of war by Iraq. Iran against yes. the United States of America. Right. We should properly be answered by a real, honest-to-goodness war in the dictionary meaning of the term. Should we choose to do it, that, is, that would be the way to do it. That's bracing. Yes, I intend it to be. <laughs> Thank you, Angelo Cotovella. You're welcome. Thank you very much.